So this is what I want to tell you about. What is our to-do list for the remainder of this commission mandate? And maybe if I start by saying, what, who are we? What's us? Uh, narrowly, DG Connect is 1,200 uh, civil servants working in Brussels and Luxembourg for one of the vice presidents for Nelly Cruz. Uh, my job as a director general, what does it mean? It's either Sir Humphrey in Europe, for those of you who watched Yes Minister, or as I more often say to my colleagues, the, general, the director general in indicates the general direction. Everybody else knows actually what to do. Um, but at another level, the... No, I am going backwards. At another level, the, um, the, the, the agenda can only be achieved by cooperation. I mean, this is not an area where the treaty gives the European Union powers to negotiate on its own as on trade or to make decisions on its own like the competition commissioner. Here we are working in a collective participatory leadership between public authorities, big companies, organizations of goodwill, and the rest of our European and indeed global partners. So as Nelly says, so if it's the busiest year for her, it's the busiest year for, for me. Uh, this is a crucial year on which to maintain momentum towards the goals we had. This was the first uh, Europe 2020 policy paper that was adopted by the Commission in 2010. It had 101 actions in it. Now what we're trying to do, having made a good deal of progress, is to focus on the things that matter. But let me start by saying that we still believe that this agenda is crucial to recovery, growth, and jobs in Europe. Uh, I, I was saying uh, over lunch to some of you that the, uh, the sense I had as a newcomer myself in 2010 is that people said, well, you're a sort of ICT techie uh, part of the European administration, so you would say that all things telecom, all things IT research would uh, matter for Europe. What I think has happened in the last two years is that everybody now gets the message. There have been so many uh, world-class reports demonstrating that the, uh, the growth rates that we enjoy can be tweaked upwards year by year if we have more IT inside than not. And I think that progressively that message has been fully understood. So these are just, I'm not going to take you through every slide, they'll be there in case you want to have a crib sheet. But it's clear that, firstly, we're talking already today in a narrow sense that the ICT sector is 6% of EU GDP. But at one level, it's 100% of EU GDP because there are very few things you can do today as a, as a profitable model or in terms of public good uh, distribution to citizens without the IT inside. But the other point that I would really emphasize is the second box up on the, what will be for you, the left-hand side. You don't have to be a high-tech SME to benefit from ICT. This is a Boston Consulting Group survey. SMEs that put the web and IT into their business model, who truly modernize and take advantage of what uh, off-the-shelf high-tech has to offer, they grow faster than everybody else. And that's true in all the surveyed countries across Europe. So if we want more growth and more jobs, IT inside is the way to get it. And the proof is that even on today's growth rates in the sector, we're three quarters of a million short of skilled graduates able to contribute to that sector. So we face a huge uh, potential crunch, but let's look at the upside. We face a huge potential bonanza in demand for high quality jobs. And they're not jobs for which you have to do 20, 20 years in a, in a lab. They're jobs where experience around the world shows that you can do 12 to 18 months upskilling and begin to be useful. There are some, you know, there's some high tech stuff where you do need 20 years in a lab. But there are hundreds of thousands of jobs to be built if we get this right. And I think that those who are telling us what they believe Europe should be doing agree with that. So eight out of 10 say, let's have more coordination to do it right on the ICT front. Let's say that at national level as well, nine out of 10 want more to be done. And again, education and skills, nine out of 10 of our respondents when we did a reality check on our study, said, yes, this is the right way to go, but you need to focus more on education and skills. And what you see here is that if we could 
move away still a step or two more to, from national frameworks towards the digital single market, then we would get more jobs, more factor productivity growth, so lower overheads for every company in the economy, and higher GDP gain. This is another way of looking at the same thing. And what this one tells you is that it's true for public sector innovation as well. In the country I know best, which is across the water in the UK, they're currently debating, do we need to reform the civil service? The answer as a lifelong civil servant is always yes, but be careful with us. Um, in a country like this, I think there are debates as well about how many people do you need and how should you structure them. If you restructure the way you deliver public services to incorporate ambient IT so that pensioners know that by default they can get everything they want from the comfort of their sitting room or the local library, they, don't, they can have paper if they like, um, then you begin to change the way in which a whole public administration works. And there are countries that do very well in pushing towards that. There are good news examples about how you empower um, the less favoured citizens, whether the old, the unemployed, the less educated in this country, in Malta, in Norway, in Poland. So we need to do more of that. There are people who don't yet have the abilities to interact over the web with their public administrations, but we can fix that, and we need to fix that. So public sector innovation is part of the story as well. But let me then come to the one that I personally believe is the big focus for this year, which is entrepreneurship. In Davos at the end of next month, um, my boss will be, among others, pushing for a more supportive environment for high-tech entrepreneurs across Europe. Many of the biggest companies, whether in this country or other member states, are also, I think, catching on to the idea that it's not enough for them to grow their own supply chain and their own ecosystem. It's in their interest to, to spread the good news, to devote ICT know-how, whether that's in a, a high-tech company or in the advertising sector, to enabling new entrepreneurs to say, yes, I can do this. I understand how I can do it. So there is a gap between the eight out of 10 school leavers who say, I've got an idea I could be an entrepreneur, and the one out of 10 who actually try it. We need to close that gap. We need to make it possible for more talented young people to try to do the things they want to do. And at the other end, we need to take away some of the obstacles that will trip them up. The tax regime is suboptimal for startups in every country in Europe. We could tweak some of that. And ICT is part of that, but, but entrepreneurship is the big, the big skill. Now then, I, I added a little arrow to this slide, which I take round everywhere, and you can't see everything, but broadly, on the, on the vertical axis, you have the World Economic Forum Competitive Index, and across the bottom, fixed broadband lines per hundred of the population. And Ireland is at the sharp end of the arrow, so pretty much on the latest statistics in the middle. You've got people like the Netherlands at the top end, people like Bulgaria at the bottom, and therefore... I, I use that not to engage in a sort of beauty contest, but to observe that if the competitiveness agenda, the sort of conditions for entrepreneurship that I've just been discussing, are important, you can see that in, in, in the part of Europe we're standing in today, there are issues both on the ICT-specific agenda, rolling out more broadband, which means investing more and building the demand, and also on the issue of the broader business climate. And in addition to fixing those two things, we have to fix the way individual citizens think about this very techy environment. I don't think my grandmother quite trusted the motor car. My mother didn't trust video machines. And there are a lot of people still alive in Europe today who don't trust the internet. And probably they were all uh, not wrong in their degree of suspicion, but we need as a, as a continent to grow more quickly uh, comfortable with new profiles of risk in new areas of activity, not so that we do everything naively, but so that we make a sober personal choice as opposed to saying, I don't want that, it's too difficult. So building trust and justifying trust are two very crucial missing bits of the, uh, of the mix at the moment. And then if I look more generally, so here we have 
the international comparisons around those three sets of issues, competitiveness, IT rollout, trust. You've also got research, you've got education and training, labor market. From a distance, it's all pretty much of a muchness. So you might say, well, so Japan, Canada, the US, and Europe, it's about the same. But there are some quite telling nuances if we compare these spider charts. And I, I apologize that it's a bit small for those at the back. So broadly, what this tells you is it's, we are the worst. I mean, we, the, the margin by which Europe needs to pick up most is the labor market and employment conditions. So that's not all about trashing European values. We need to do something about that, however. And on social inclusion, of course, we're among the best, but we're not the best. Canada's the best. So this is not a right-left debate. If, we, if, if we're right to say those are the pillars of competitiveness, it's not about do you sweat the workers or maintain the welfare state, because there are other places in the world that are growing faster who have a better overall profile and who are um, in the social sphere, I would say, pretty supportive, a bit like Europe. So, so worth knowing that, that we can do better in areas like innovation, in areas like the enterprise environment, in areas like research, without necessarily having a highly political and, and divisive debate about destroying society or something of that sort. Now, the to-do list, I mean, this is the only slide you really need to retain, and it's in slightly bigger print, though probably still a bit small for those at the back. So I'm just going to read it out. These are the seven actions that we have concluded, having achieved a lot of the previous 101, are the focus for the next two years at least. So the broadband regulatory environment, there are people more expert than me about that in the room, but... What we've decided to do there, and, and nearly announced it in the summer, is to try to adjust the regulatory environment in Europe so you can have still enough competition and a bit more investment. Secondly, we're currently negotiating under the Irish chairmanship to finalize the budget planning from 2014 onwards. We want a new tool called a Connecting Europe facility to connect better uh, the, the bits that the market doesn't yet reach not only in ICT, also in energy and also in transport. And the three fit together because, as, uh, as is clear in this country and in some others, energy companies can string fiber over their high-tension wires. So, so the, the three are not three separate silos, but that's the second thing. A bit more public financial support to more rollout of broadband and to the provision of services over it. So cross-border access to your e-health data if you fall ill in uh, London or Benidorm. Um, cross-border access to your verified government ID if you want to uh, have public services in some other part of Europe that you're legally entitled to, but what sort of proof do you have to give, and so on and so on. Thirdly, uh, on the back of the Davos agenda, coming back to Brussels in March to launch a grand coalition on skills and jobs, whereby we go to the big companies, we go to the employment centers, we go to the tertiary institutes, and we say, so we don't have enough skills, and young people don't have enough jobs, and these problems are coinciding in specific towns and cities around Europe. Can we set a specific agenda where we're going to get these skills in this town and different skills in another town? And hopefully with a commitment, as we've got in some member states, People coming out of that process will at least interview them, or the dream, people coming out of that process with the good diploma, we're going to try them out for 18 months at least. Thirdly, cyber security. So this is on the trust part. Every time you see about cyber security, you see the bad news because uh, you see about Sony PlayStation, you see about, in the latest in my case was that the Belgian railways had lost all the subscriber information from anybody who'd ever bought a ticket from them in the last six months. So you see problems. We believe that the problems often are cross-border, and the agencies which may be effective in different member states are actually not so effective at talking to each other. So a modest proposal for cooperation coming soon, coordinated between the IT commissioner uh, Baroness Ashton, who does the foreign affairs, and Cecilia Malmstrom, who's the security commissioner. Copyright, uh, again, modest, but we need to have, on the basis of the structured dialogue that we've already begun, but we'll finish this year, some clear vision how to make 
territorial rules such as copyright fit for a digital world which is inherently borderless, accelerating our work on cloud computing. The cloud's the next big thing. We don't use enough of it. It's growing more slowly in Europe as a business case than in North America and from a lower base. So we really need to catch up there. And finally, uh, coming back to the research side, that also depends on Irish chairmanship of the budget discussions, in 2014 we start the next, not a 10-year or 5-year plan, the next 7-year plan for research and innovation in Europe. We need to have a, a better industrial strategy to maintain and to retain in some cases and regain in others a, a, a leading place for Europe in what we call key enabling technologies, the KETs, and emerging electronics, the next generations of chips, the next generations of computing, both in uh, data centers and embedded in your cars and aeroplanes, are, we think, an area where Europe can big, be a big winner. So those are the seven areas that we intend to focus on. That's the hard core of the digital agenda. And if we get it right, there will be more growth and jobs. And the question, which I'd be in, I don't have the answer to this question, but I think it's the right question, what can be done at every level across Europe to take the right proportions of this sort of agenda and make it a, a national agenda? On the broadband side, for example, in most countries over the last two years, and Ireland is no exception, there is a national broadband plan. It has to be national, and it has to have local granularity because what's there already varies, and how you can build the market towards what you need will vary. But the key question is what can be done at different levels and how from the smallest sub-municipal redevelopment plan in an old steel mill in Wales, which is where I was on Friday, right up to the sort of rarefied reaches of the European Council chaired by the, uh, by, by the Taoiseach, at every level we need to work out how it fits together. So that's the key question. And then I've put at the end some, uh, uh, some links in case uh, keen uh, members of the audience want to dig deeper. So, Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you.